I know this is billed as like CERN and particle physics, but in essence, this is uh, CERN and particle physics in the classroom. So it's bringing CERN into your classrooms in a really practical way, and you'll have a few little bits and pieces around you there. And if you're just coming in, maybe join one of the groups there because you'll need the equipment. You'll be moving in a minute if you don't. Um, a little bit just about me um, and why I'm doing this. Um, so I'm eight years teaching maths and physics, so not that long um, in teaching. And I'm currently teaching Colossia Valley Clore in Clare Galway, which is just out, out the road here. Um, we're a new school, so we're just in our third year. So I don't have any seniors at the minute, so I have time to be doing all of this kind of stuff. And this is like a holiday from junior science for me this weekend. I'm like planning for this just is, it was lovely because it was like going back to senior physics times again. Um, the reason I'm here is because summer 2014, I attended the high school teachers program, the HST program in CERN, which if you haven't heard of it, it's a, a three week residential program. So you're, uh, it's for physics teachers. Uh, there were 50 physics teachers there the year I was there. I think there were another 50 there just this summer gone. And it is working uh, basically three full weeks living in CERN, uh, working uh, on different projects that are related to particle physics, attending lectures sometimes until 10, 11 at night, meeting the people who discovered and worked on the Higgs and having them explain it to you, first of all in quite layman's terms, and then really stepping it up as three weeks went on, as you can imagine. After three weeks of listening to lectures, you're able to derive the equation by the end of it. So it, got, it was very intense, fabulous. It's like the best uh, experience of my Adult, like working life because in terms of CPD um, you know it the point of it is to inspire teachers and it absolutely did that for me and everybody who, who stood up in front of us and spoke said I you know I might be working now as a scientist but at one point I was in a classroom and you were standing in front of me and I need you to inspire more people so you know that's their goal and so they, they really spend a long time doing that and I also spend most evenings catching up on particle physics for beginners from Frank there, so thanks Frank for your YouTube lectures, which definitely got me through at least the first week of it. Um, what I'm gonna go through with you today, depending on how timing goes, we probably won't get into the lesson plans, but that's no problem. The main thing I wanna talk to you about is the critical thinking activities. And so these are lessons which I've kind of designed and part of stuff that I found while we were in CERM and, and worked with and was showed to us there, um, to engage students in classes um, around this topic and to kind of build a kind of a, something concrete out of what can often be when you're teaching particle physics at, at Leaving Cert can often be an abstract topic it can often be a topic that you say it's the easy option if you're good at learning stuff you can learn it you'll get your A because it's always very fairly similar kind of things that come up and I, I'd like you just to see ways that you can make it a lot more practical um, also talk to you a little bit about extracurricular links with CERN and then this, this PowerPoint will go up wherever all the other ones are going and um, the lesson plans are in there as well so it's the lesson plans which I won't get into I'll just talk to you briefly what they are they're kind of geared at any age group so introduction to CERN um, Ireland's status what it, what it means to be a member state which we're not by the way and the history of CERN which is really interesting um, that could be given at CSB any, any kind of a lesson like that because it's about collaboration in science about working together within Europe about a kind of a common goal and also then there's a section on accelerating particles so talking about charged particles uh, about detectors again it's geared from junior right the way up to senior so it starts easy gets hard and detectors which is probably the most interesting part of it that's more geared at seniors because there's a lot more kind of in there about the different de different types of particles and also a little bit on data storage which you might think sounds very boring but data storage in CERN is definitely Definitely not boring. It's definitely one of the interesting things. So first activity I want to go through with you is um, the black box and this is a, a, a critical thinking activity okay so I have six of most things so if you could be sitting in six places that would be absolutely super um, and then you'll all be able to interact at some point so you pass one behind you there and one if you pass it that way as well and I'll hand this one out in a minute I'll give you that um, and I'll give this to you in a second but I just want to show you so Basically, the idea here is, okay, you're a scientist presented with this cylinder. Don't look inside, okay, you're not allowed to look inside. By examining just the movement of the rope, so you interact with it, examine the movement of the ropes, and then you develop two hypotheses about what's happening in this system. And so, as usual, you know, in, in, in schools, we would get them to share their first hypothesis with their partner. So they, they play with it themselves a little bit. And, and you can see, playing with this, it becomes quite obvious really quickly what's happening in here you know, or, or does it? So you have to come up with some sense of your own hypothesis, share it, and then 
The second one, you're going to draw on the whiteboard. And I want you to do this because I think until you do it, you don't see the benefit that this is in a classroom situation. So I want you to draw after you've expl explored it a little bit. So explore and play. And if you want to move a little closer there, just so you can get in. Explore, play, and kind of try and figure it out. And then see if you can draw on the whiteboard there. And if you need pens, I think we should be OK. Whiteboards and pens. Have you whiteboard and pen? Not, not on you. I think I supply them. <laughs> I see you looking in your pocket. <laughs> How are we doing on time, Paul? Do you know? Four. Okay. They're exploring at the minute. <laughs> So this activity one, sorry. Okay, so you're a scientist with this right. cylinder. You just got to figure out what's going on and draw. Okay. It. So you're you're confident. And is this a knot? What's the what's is it a knot? Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to push you for a solid answer. You have a ring on it. Okay, yeah. Not knot, not knot. It could be a knot. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so guys, can I push you now? Can you put your idea down on the whiteboard? If you haven't already done so, can you draw your idea? This is your second hypothesis, or basically your revised hypothesis. I want you as a group to commit. Not at all. Listen, I, I, a lot of this now can be moved, yeah. Okay, guys, so if we, I know you're curious, but we want to make sure we get through the three activities. So I'm going to just stop you there. This activity you could run, I ran it for an hour last Tuesday just to get the following photos. I ran this with juniors. Like I said, we only have juniors. We're growing every year. It actually works much, much better with, with adults than it did with the kids. It worked fantastic with them. We had a full hour of discussion, revising, sharing, revising, sharing, revising, sharing. Um, and justifying. So every time a student shares an idea, they have to justify. So they stand up in front and they say, well, it goes like this because. And the other person who has shared is allowed to contradict or, or allowed to challenge. So once they finish presenting, you allow another student to challenge their proposal by showing evidence to contrary that. And I know what you're thinking. Why are we here doing this particular activity when it said CERN at the beginning? But if you think about it, well, that's really exactly what CERN is. Um, and that's really not just what CERN is, but that's what particle physics is. We make a proposal or a hypothesis about what's going on based on the evidence and the experiments that we carry out and the evidence that we get from those experiments. And so uh, we're developing evidence-based models which are accepted to be true until we have some piece of experimental evidence which challenges it. And then it's like, oh, well, then it just string theory can't be there because that, that, other, that other theory came through strong instead. So you can see that this is exactly what CERN is. You're linking them in. Having this in the classroom is just a nice activity to do at any point, to just engage them for a second. And if you're, you're, I'm sure you're all mad curious. So if you want to just pop the lid off the top of them, there's one of them that doesn't have a lid, and I'm sorry about that. It's the shortest one. Uh, but if you just pop the lid off the top of them, the Pringles lid should open. Okay, so, so you, you actually can't, and I won't tell you, because there's no, there's no right answer, but you can never look inside uh, at, at what's going on in the atoms either, so you can never ever see. But in each case, what I did with my, with my students that worked on it, you say if they justify it, it doesn't matter what it looks like, if they can justify it based on their evidence, then you say, perfect, that's it, absolutely, working theory, well done. The second one, so you all should have, in front of you, you should have an envelope, and in it you should have kinder eggs, two kinder yellow eggs, and you can just pop them open and can you shake out what's inside them and what's inside them is quarks and then you should also have a little thing on a string the little thing on the string is an electron now the kinder egg represents baryons so you've got your neutron and your proton and you know it's a neutron or a proton because it should be labeled on top um, it should say a zero on the top and it should say a plus one if it's a proton 
The quarks are all labelled, obviously. You'll see ups, downs, all the rest of them, and their fractional charges. And then you've got the electron, which just should have an E on it, and it should be on a string. Okay? I'll just show you four different activities you can do with these particular, uh, these ones here. And this is something, each one of the forces now is represented by a model. There's two really obvious ones. A magnet represents one of the four forces. Which one? <laughs> The electromagnetic, lovely. Falling represents as one of them. Which one? Gravity. Gravity, right. So we've got two of the forces down, which leaves Lego and Velcro up for grabs. What does the Lego click represent in terms of forces? And what does Velcro stickiness represent in terms of forces? The Velcro is on the quarks and it's also on the outside of the neutron and the proton. And that's what's bonding the neutron and the proton in the nucleus, is the Velcro. The Lego click is the weak force. And I think you'll find with the quarks, this, the, the, definitely the Velcro is stronger as a connection than, than the other one. So in terms of it actually working out by magnitude as well, I think it does kind of work this way. The Lego is a bit easier to break apart. So that brings you then to this activity, whereby now you have another fantastic table that they have to learn off in their book. Well, don't ever give them a table to learn off in physics. Get them to figure out the answer. Give them clues, give them something to play with, and let them now deduce. What is the fermions, what are the hadrons, and how would I know them? Now, I also have the information as clues and getting them to come up with the table. What is the electron falling into? If you look here, the leptons, it's elementary, but it doesn't feel the strong nuclear force. So you're looking there on your table, which one doesn't have Velcro? And hopefully you have the electron on the string and you can see that. And if you look over here at the hadrons, the baryons, they feel all four forces. So you, now you're looking at either you're looking at the yellow kinder egg or the quark but it's, only, it's made of three elementary particles, so now you know it must be the yellow one. So there's a process of elimination, really nice activity to get them basically to deduce these th themselves. Um, the last one of these activities then is um, the quark model, which is probably why I designed this task in the first place. I wanted them to build a proton and build a neutron, and then once I had them built, I thought, oh, you can do all sorts of fun things with them. Um, so the quarks, that's just your, your straight up quarks. Um, I've given you 18, 18 quarks in each set because there's potential for them to build things now outside of just protons and neutrons. Obviously, you can build a couple of different things and, and you can get them thinking, well, what if it was two strangers and a whatever, you know, and then starting to mix in. Um, apologies, Frank, for such a flippant comment, two strangers and a whatever. But um, if you think here, you can get them to make a stable proton and neutron and they need to know, they need to know that for leaving cert physics. So that's very easy to do, put them in and now they have their proton and their neutron made. And if you guys do that, what I found very nice about this is that if you put the up, up, down together to make a proton um, and you just let them not Velcro together, but you let them be together by the magnet, the magnet if you want to do it just there. So don't have them Lego click together, have them just click together by the magnets. That is a very gluony feel. Not that I know what a gluon field feels like, but they kind of seem to move a little bit free around themselves. And that's very good in terms of a model for how they are in the nucleus. So you have these three of them there that are kind of magnetically, loosely magnetically connected, but you could shuffle them in your hand and they would shake. And that's what every animation yeah, of, of a gluon field looks like. Okay, so, so that one works really nice. Obviously, then you can take this into an antimatter really quickly make an antiproton, make an antineutron, you can spend a whole class on this, no problem. What do you notice about antiparticles versus particles? Um, and, and talking a little bit about that, I mean, there's really quite a lot of scope you can go to on this one. Uh, just, yeah, if you didn't know your protons and neutrons there. And I, and I really feel after this activity, you've given the students a real sense of a physical or, or, or a visual representation of what the atom looks like on a, a kind of more higher order level. Um, the very last one then is building a conservation equation. So here's just an example then of bringing, linking this to CERN again. So we have a, the proton-proton equation. So uh, on the left-hand side of my equation here, I have two protons. Then on the right-hand side of the equation, I have a neutron. So let's imagine that's a neutron. And I have three pions, which as I said, these are just made from a different color, uh, one to make them stand out. And I might borrow two here and imagine that these are two protons. Obviously in a classroom, I'd have that done properly. And then you get them to build this. You get them to observe what's going on here. So we have here, we have three quarks and three quarks. We have six quarks on the left-hand side of the equation. On the right-hand side of the equation, we have three, six, nine, and six, because each of these mesons has two quarks in it. So we have 15 quarks on the right-hand side of the equation. And hopefully now you're going to have students at this point going, well, that doesn't make sense. No equations should have more things on one side than the other. So then if you don't have one of these in your classroom, 
you need to get one of these in your classroom, which is just a box with a question mark on it. And now you say the equations are balanced. What have I added to the left hand side that it balances with the right hand side? Very simple. And you say, well, what you've added must be mass. And you say, yeah, in essence, what I've added is mass. But it's just that, what do we do in CERN? What do we do with these two super things in CERN? And you talk about energy. And there you have Einstein's equation just so nicely linked in. And it's very, very visual. So you have add energy to this, make it equal to that. That's the main leaving CERN question that they get on it. You know? so, so it's just taking that equation, I suppose, from the exam papers and giving them something that they link it back to that sounds re realistic. Obviously, then you can talk to them about, well, I haven't considered a question mark or energy in terms of kinetic on the right hand side. Is that accurate? Obviously not. But look, we can't do everything. <laughs> so, um, OK, so that's the second one. If you want to just pop all that stuff back into one envelope for me and just put it to the side and hopefully we will have time to do the third one. So you should have at your place, you should have a cork tile, a black cork tile or somewhere near you if you can find one of those. And you should have two pins. If you don't have pins, I've loads of spare ones, but you should have two pins. So if you can put in those two pins like this into the white circles there, and then you should also have two, uh, oh yeah, they might be in the other envelope on your one. You can put a piece of white paper then, this white paper there, you want to put it underneath it. And it should look something like this one. So you've got your cork tile, you've got a white sheet of paper which has a line on it, that's the screen. And then you can see here you've got two pins. Now this is a bit of a stretch to link it to CERN, but I'm just going to do it by very, very loosely by saying wave particle duality. Done. So this is again from the Perimeter Institute. If you've um, any experience of their website and their resources, they are fantastic stuff up there. So I really recommend having a look. In terms of what it takes to make this, very simple straws. It's the hard acetate that can go straight into a photocopier. And I've attached the PDF that you can um, print those waves on. So two waves, the waves are printed same um, amplitude, frequency, and, and so they'll, they'll be in phase. And you can pull them together there to get them into phase. And I'll just show you, the first thing here will be observing constructive and destructive interference. Now that's not the best version of it, so I have a better version. That's my own written waves. Uh, you can see they're a bit squiggledy. But if you just look at this video here, you can see how you would do this. So observing constructive and destructive interference. Another topic which is very abstract for the students, superposition of waves. They just don't see waves overlapping in the same way as we do. <laughs> um, so you can see here, constructive interference, there's this beautiful lining up of waves. Destructive interference is even nicer. You see this gorgeous um, misalignment. And it can be really per you can be really specific on the location of your fringes here by looking at this. Um, the reason I've used the cardboard is so that you can just use the chalk to colour on your interference pattern. It's always nice on the right-hand side using chalk. You can rub it off again. Um, and, it, and obviously then the white on the black is obviously a really nice pattern to show. Um, I'll just show you that again, the interference pattern here, because one thing that's really super about this is getting the path difference, which is obviously another big problem for students. What is the path difference? So if you guys just line them up so they're in phase in the middle at your central maximum, you'll see that there's no path difference and also you've no extra wave on one side as you push them. As I push it up, you'll notice here at this point now, you have one of them has one extra wave on it. So very obviously you have a path difference of one wavelength. And so then you can say to them, line it up now at n equals one. And then once it's lined up at n is equal to one, you can ask them, well, what distance has the first one traveled that the second one has not? And straight away you'll have, well, it's one full wave. OK, so our path difference is one wavelength, which again, I have always found a very difficult thing to explain to them. They just say, well, how do I know? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? And as you go up to n is two, you'll see two full waves. n is three, you'll see three full waves. So that brings you then very readily into deriving the equation. Once you have them observing it that way, you can really, really easily derive the equation from that. So I'll just show you again, lining them up. So observing the fringes here. Um, so that's uh, the three different activities. Again, if you want to just put all that stuff back into one of the envelopes and just put them to the side, I'll very quickly talk to you about CERN and your school and how you can get involved at an extracurricular kind of level. So particle physics masterclasses. I don't know, is there anybody in here who's been to one? 
They are absolutely fantastic. I did one of these last summer. That was part of what we did was to experience the full master class. And you, you're bringing your students into the universities, PhD students or postdoc students, working with your students on a computer in pairs with a, with a, a supervisor. And they're taking real data. I'm not kidding. It's real CERN data. They take that data and they uh, open it in this lovely software, which shows them the detection points and it shows them the patterns that are coming off. So you can see up here on the top right, you get this, uh, the collision site patterns in the detectors. And then they've had lectures in the morning on what a Higgs event looks like. What are you searching for as a scientist at CERN if you're looking for a Higgs event? And therefore they're thinking, okay, these W bosons, how will I spot them? What will they disintegrate into? I can't connect, I can't figure out what a boson looks like, but I can figure out what a muon looks like, what a neutrino looks like, whatever else looks like in the detector. So what am I looking for on the detector image? I'm looking for this and this to be. So they, send, they, they look at it and they say, well, that one has to be a muon, that line, but it's positive. We're looking for negative muons, keep looking. And I mean, it's, it's fabulous. At the end of the day, they do a kind of a Skype conference call with other schools around the country who are um, doing, doing the same thing and they, they share, not around the country, it's in Europe, and they'll share information with Atlas as well. Yeah. Really nearly finished, yeah. yeah. So uh, second one is Beamline for Schools. Again, if you have a very higher level class, this is the one to use. It's a competition they've been running for the last three years. You come up with a, an idea, believe it or not, on which to use one of the beams in CERN. So if, you, if your class designs an experiment that can run on one of the beams in CERN, the T9 beam, there's loads of uh, helpful documentation for teachers on what would be a suitable experiment. Then if they enter this competition and they win, they will travel to CERN and run their experiment in CERN on one of the beams. It's pretty amazing. So simple ideas like de design your own detector and then go to CERN and get it calibrated, super. Find out how many hadrons and electrons actually will go through different materials. Have you a certain product you want to test? Well, why don't you design a, a full experiment and bring it there and do it? Fabulous experiment. Beamline for schools is that one. And the last one that I want to say is visit CERN. If you haven't been, visit CERN. The tours are free. It's very expensive in Geneva, but it's absolutely worth it. There's tons of other stuff to do when you're there as well. Besides all of this, the UN, the Red Cross, WHO, and the fact that visiting CERN will be the most inspiring thing you do with your kids, you can go skiing as well, because there's lots of that. Okay, so the lessons will be on the PowerPoint. There's three different lesson plans that you can use in schools. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're done. Thanks.